Yeah. If we wanted to be able to restrict to topology, we said that we need a way to count faces, right? In other words, we said we need a way to split these three into two plus one, right? So split the, those three graphs to separate them into genus zero and genus one. Right? So that's what we aim at. And as we explained, the basic idea is to transform our fundamental object of integration, which is x, i, a vector. We, will, we are going to transform it into a fundamental object that has two indices. So instead of just one line getting out when we do weak contraction, we represent it as a, a ribbon and it will have indices i and j, and this will be a matrix. Okay. The idea being that a very simple graph, let's say a triangle graph, for example, which has two faces, the inside and the outside of the triangle, would now become, if we do this, if we fatten each line, now you see that I get an explicit line for the inner face and the line for the outer face, right? Now I have two faces and I have two lines. And if I say that these values of the matrix can take values one to n, right? If I double n, I double the result of this integral from the point of view of the inside, but I quadruple, I multiplied by four, in fact, because there are a factor outside as well. So there is a factor of n from the number of options of which, in, which value this index takes inside, which value it takes outside. So I get n to the two, and this is the number of faces. Right, so that's the idea, is to try to have, if we fatten the graph, then by counting possibilities for what is flowing, we can automatically count boundaries and therefore count faces. Okay, so, so let me tell you what the object then is. The object we want to introduce is, let me introduce, we had straight like this z, we did not have this z yet, right? We had curly z, we had mass bbz, and this one is mu. So this is the matrix model z. Let's define this as an integral and now here, let me put some funny symbol of integration that I will now say what it is. These matrices are going to be Hermitian, like physical observables. So they are going to be Hermitian, n by n matrices. Okay, so we are going to integrate over matrices that are Hermitian. An Hermitian matrix, this means that M, I, J, star is M, J, I. So in particular, it means that M, I, I is real and M, I, J is, let's say, X, I, J plus I, Y, Y, J, where this guy is symmetric but this guy is anti-symmetric, right? So off-diagonal element one three is a conjugate of three one. And X and Y are both real. Right, and we can define this guy, it's real, we can say it's X I I. Right? Then this funny DM is just integration over those, over this. It is just product of D, M, I, I, which, which we said it's D, X, I, right? Or D, X, I, I. Product over I smaller than J, right? Because one, three and three, one are the same, so there's no point in duplicating. D, X, I, J, D, Y, I, J. Right, so that's 
uh, very explicitly what this means. Right? So you see that this is an integration over how many? So it's the off-diagonal element, so it's n square minus uh, n square minus n over two. No, it's the off-diagonal, all the off-diagonal elements minus n plus n. So n square variables, right? It's funny. I thought it was n square minus one uh, or n square minus n. So I, J, it's, uh, I have a matrix, I have the off diagonal ones, which is N square minus N, and I have the diagonal ones, which is N extra variables. Okay, so it's okay. So that's what this integration over N over M means. And then let's continue defining our M. Then we have exponential of minus, and now we want the analog of the X square over two, but now we have a matrix, right? So if it was a vector, the natural generalization was x dot x or x matrix and x. But now it's a matrix, so what, was, what would be the natural thing to write for the kinetic term? Or one possibility for the simplest possible kinetic term? I need something, the analog of x squared, but it needs to be a number. I cannot put m squared. So how can I get a number out of m squared? So m, m squared makes sense, right? It's m times m as matrix, right? So I can say it's m square, but I want a number. Trace, right? Trace is the simplest thing. Trace, let's put over two as usual, right? So this would be a simple proposal plus g trace of m to the power. So that's our definition of our partition function. Okay. Or if you want more precisely, because we don't want to worry ab no about normalization, let's divide this by the same thing with g equals zero. Right? Then whatever the integral gives with g equals zero, it's the analog of our integral without sources. We just divide by it, that's just normalization. You can put it if you want in the integration measure this one. Okay, so l let's try to see a, a little bit what this is. So first of all, this part here, I hope you agree, this is the analog of our, this is just m i j m j i, right? It's just product of the matrices and trace, right? So this is just this. <coughs> which is equal to, if j is equal to i, I get x i i, so this is equal to the sum over i of x i i square, and when a is not equal to i, I get plus, it can be smaller or bigger, and it will give the same thing by factor of two, so there will be a two sum over i smaller than j x, i j square plus y i j square. And so we see that these x's and y's, they are just a bunch of decoupled variables, right? So we have the, the x i j, the y i j, and the x i i's, right? And there is no, if I want to see now what would happen to weak contractions, the expectation value of x12, x12 would be equal to one, right? But any one which is not diagonal, x12, y13 equals zero, right? All other ones would be zero. So, so it would be just diagonal, the same variable would give correlation function one, different variables would give zero, right? And now that I know this, I can ask, what is the contraction between m i j and m k l. Okay? So now let's see, because this is the fundamental object. I don't want to go inside and see it real and imaginary part. I want to compute this expectation value of these two matrices. 
Now, this guy has a real part, and this guy has an imaginary part as well. Let's suppose they are off diagonal, okay? If they are diagonal, we'll see, we can see later. But let's suppose this is off diagonal, this is off diagonal. I not equal to J, K not equal to L, okay? Now, if I J is equal to K L, notice that the result is zero. Because if I J is equal to K L, the real part give one, the imaginary part give one, but because of I square minus one, cancel. You agree? I expand out, I get only real part and imaginary part, but I get zero because it's one minus one. Right? So when do, when do I get not zero? You see, if they are equal, I get zero. If they are different, I also get zero, obviously. Right? So when do I get non-zero? Exactly, the conjugate. So if here I have one five and here five one, then I don't get zero. Because then the real part has one sign, the imaginary part has the opposite sign, but there is an I square, so they double instead of canceling. So if you do it carefully, and it's in the node, with all factors of two that you have to be careful, you see that you get that the first index, delta I, needs to be equal to the last index, and the last index, J, needs to be equal to the first index, K. So they don't need to be the same, but they need to be the same, the first index with the last, the last with the first. But that's nice, because that's what we would draw naively. If I think of a matrix, I and J, and if I want to distinguish which index is which, I would put an arrow, for example, I would say that the last index goes out, the first index goes in. This would be a representation for my matrix M, I, J, just so I would keep track of, uh, of which index is which, if I have two points. And then, uh, if I connect it here, right? now I want to connect it here, look at this picture. Now, K is the first index, so K should, uh, is like the I. K is the first index, should have, let me, this is L, this is K, let's see if it makes sense. So M, I, J, and here, sorry, one second, I goes in and to first. Ah, no, because here I said something wrong. I want I to go to L, I want LK, sorry. LK, precisely, right? So from this notation, I would like the arrow to come in to be the first index by convention, and the arrow to go out to be L, so if the arrows want to match, they better be like this. In other words, matrices, the first index likes to be contracted with the last index. That's what's nifty. It's not to contract first index with first index and last index with last index. Right, you multiply matrices by doing first with last, first with last, first with last. Okay, so this is the picture. This is the formula and this is the picture, right? So that now, and this is the analog of our x a x b being equal to our inverse of our kinetic matrix element a b. Right? So that's exactly what we did. What is our vector x here? It's just all possible components of the matrix. m11, x11, x12, x13, x14, y12, y13, y14. All variables would be our vector x. But it's not very convenient to use a vector index because it's more convenient to use a matrix index, but it's the same, right? So this is exactly equivalent, where this A now for us is a pair of indices, I, J, instead of just one index, but it's just a way of parameterizing one index, right? And it turns out that this matrix here is this matrix here, right? So it's just one choice of our kinetic term, right? Yes. So I, I, I decide that the arrow has a direction because if it doesn't, I would be able to connect them in both ways, right? When an arrow has a direction, I cannot put arrow that, that are not pointing in the same direction, I cannot glue them, right? So this propagator, this is not the same. There is, I'm not saying it's this plus 
I replaced with J. It's not true. I just want one choice. First index goes to last, last goes to first. So I need an arrow to indicate that. Right? I need to keep track of who is the first index, who is the last index. In practice, often we will forget the arrows, but strictly speaking, the arrows would indicate for the matrix who is the first index, who is the last index. Okay? Okay, so that's our propagator. So indeed, we are, we could have defined, this could have been our definition. I could say there, there is some quadratic form that gives me this, right? This defines my inverse. Now, invert it to find what quadratic form you need. Like in our examples of red and blue, we said I want this for the inverse, find out whatever A you need, right? So this could have been our starting point, our definition, right? But since the naive guess immediately gives the right result, it, we were lucky. So we could have started with the most obvious guess, this trace of n square, and perhaps it gave something that we did not like. We would have, then we would go and define this and see what we would need to start. But this was the simplest guess, and it gave exactly what we wanted, right? But from a logical point of view, if you want, this is what we really were after. That's what I wanted to do in pictures, and it's beautiful that it's coming up. Okay? Okay, so this is all about, this is what we call the fat propagator. Right, so we studied the propagator, the analog of the inverse of the matrix. Let's now see about weak contractions and vertices. How do we think of the vertices and the weak contractions? Um, okay, so now this decomposition into real part and so on, we don't need because I already know how to contract matrices, so I just, I can now just do, use Wick's theorem. So this decomposition into real and imaginary parts that I'm actually even going to erase here now, we already copied, was the intermediate step. Now that we derived the propagator between M and M, we can forget that they have a real and imaginary inner part. Now it's not important, because now we can use Wick's theorem to compute the correlation function of any product of many M's by just doing contractions of pairs of M's, okay? So now we don't need to know, we just need to know their emission, and we don't need to know the inner structure. So now let's suppose we want to compute expectation value of trace of m to the fourth because that's what happens when I expand the exponent, right? It's like our expectation value here of our, right, this three was the expectation value of x to the fourth by bringing down the exponent, right? Now we are going to do the same, do perturbation theory, expand in g, and we will have to compute this expectation value of x to the fourth, which is now trace of m to the fourth. So let's do it in formulas in this line, and then we'll do it in pictures in the line below. Okay, so in formulas first. This is expectation value. What is the trace of M? M I J multiply M J K multiply M K L multiply M L I. Do you agree? That's just writing down the multiplication. Everyone is familiar, I assume, with repeated indices being summed over, right? When I have repeated indices, there is a summation. Otherwise, you can put summations there. Okay, now I have these four guys, and this expectation value is equal to Wick's theorem, M, 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 M. I'm not writing the indices, but let me just draw the picture, whereby this, this is one term, there are three terms, you know, this is the one where I weak contract this guy with this guy, this guy with this guy. So that expectation value, this one is as this indices, i, j, j, k. Right? That's one of them. So let's indicate it here. So, okay. So that's this weak contraction. Plus, then we have the other one. Yeah, actually, I think maybe... Yeah, okay, this one I will not write, but the other one I will write, the next one, for example. The next one would be, let's draw it up here, would be this guy contracts with this one, and this guy contracts with this one. And the last one will be, let's draw it in yellow again, maybe dashed, would be this one contracts with this one, and this middle one 
constant track with the middle one. You see, I'm drawing the three different heights so that you see the three different weak contractions. Is this clear? Okay, so let's write the middle one, for example. The middle height one would be expectation value of Mij times expectation value of Mkl times, ex that's it. And then the other weak contraction, expectation value of Mjk times expectation value of Mli. Right? That's the middle weak contraction, right? Jk, Li, plus the last weak contraction. I think I will write the last one as well. <coughs> Let's write the last one as well. M, I, J, M, L, I. And then the middle two guys are contracted, M, J, K, M, K, L. Okay, so I just did not write the index of the first guy, which are obvious, right? Okay, and now for each of them, we use this formula for the delta function, right? So for each of them, we use the formula for the delta function, so let's do it. Okay, so I'll start doing it for the guys that have the indices written explicitly. So let's do it up here. I, J, K, L, so I'll just write this explicitly. This guy is delta first with last, I, L, delta, J, K. And here, delta, J, I, delta, K, L, okay. Do you agree? So far so good. What about this one? This one plus, let's do this computation here. Delta first with last. Oh, there's something nice. I, I, and then delta J, L. And then this one, first with last, delta J, L, and last with first, delta K, K. Okay? Okay, so let's go on. Let's go, we are going up because down we are going to do the picture one. So let's go up, so this one we will fill it in in a second. But what about, uh, say, let's start by this last one. This one is easier. So please look here. Delta ii, what does it give? N, right? It gives one and we sum over the index, gives N. Delta kk, N. And this product of these two. N as well, right? Because one, one contraction gives delta LL, and then I sum over L, N. So all this gives N cubed, right? Okay, so plus N cubed. What about this one, the middle one? So let's see, I needs to be equal to L, so I can go here and this L replaced by I, K, I, here I can replace by K, and at the end I get J, K, J, K which is n, so only one factor of n, right? So this is plus n, and this one, the one we did not draw, well, we can see that it is of the same time of the last one. You, when you contract these two, you will get a delta jj in the beginning and a delta ll from this contraction, so it's one of those that gives n cube as well, right? It's, a, it's of the same sort, so it's another n cube. And so, what do we get? We get two n cubed plus n. And that's exactly what we wanted, remember? We wanted to split the three into two plus one. Right? We wanted to split it exactly into two n cubed plus one. Okay. Now let's do it with pictures, because with pictures it's immediate. So we should get, we should practice doing it with pictures. Well, how would we do it with pictures? We would say this guy, trace of m squared is this. So each m is two indices and they are contracted together. So I start drawing m i j. So this is i, this is j. Okay, this is m i j. But then I have m j k. So j, this index j is the same, so I just bend it. And there is a new index, which is k. 
And then I have MKL, so K is the same index, I just bend it, and then there is a new index L. And then I have MLI, so this index is the same, and I is the other one that was here already. So that's this picture here. Okay. And you can now put arrows if you want. So th what was our convention, I forgot. I was the first index, the arrow was coming in or going out? Out, okay, so now you just complete them automatically. If you want the arrows, but it's not crucial, but. Okay. So that's our picture for our vertex. Okay. And now all we do is we go here and this vertex, we contract it in all these three possible ways. So what do we get? We get that this is equal. One possibility is I just, start, I always start with the vertex. I contract this leg with this leg and then this leg with this leg. The other possibility is I contract the first leg with the last leg, with the third leg, sorry, and then the second with the fourth. but each propagator is fat, so it becomes like this. Or I contract the first with the last, then it's just like that. The first goes to the last, and the second goes to the third. Right? And now I just say, okay, but what can this index be? Anything, so this is n, n, n. So this is automatically n cubed, the second one is n, and the last one is n cubed, okay? So you see, you do it rather automatically. You don't need to be writing delta functions or stuff. You just draw the pictures and count the loops, and you automatically get the right result. Okay? And so we get precisely what we want, our 2 n cubed plus n. Okay, but actually we can do much better. We can do much better and we can see what's happening as I'm expanding this Z. So Z will be tac, tac, tac. And then there is, let's look at one term in Z. And a term in Z will have what? It will have a given power of G to the number of vertices, right? When I expand down G, G counts the number of vertices, right? Yeah. Okay, uh, but, mm, not completely. I think I want to write the following, yeah, it's okay, okay. So, let's suppose, uh, here, okay, I'll explain. And then uh, there is N uh, to what power? For a given graph, the power of n measures what? Face, n to the number of face, right? And I remind you that edges are not fixed, they are twice the number of vertices, right? In other words, if we have the expression there, f, okay, this is okay. And let's suppose, this contribution with some constant, that's the rest of the constant. This came from some connected graph. If you want, you can restrict to connected graph either, by, for example, by taking the log. So if you write the expansion for log of z, it will only have connected graph. Okay, so we could take the log, for example. Yeah, well, why not, let's do it, log. The expansion of Z has connected and disconnected, log just has connected, let's take the log right now. Okay, but what we are interested here is to notice that therefore this term here is of the following form. When I use that F is equal, I can use from there, is equal to V plus two minus two genus. So it's equal to G times N, 
to the power v times 1 over n to the power 2 genus minus 2. So you see, I just did some trivial algebra to just rewrite a little bit. Okay. And so we see that it is maybe a good idea to say that this quantity, let's define it as lambda, it's called the tooth coupling. And let's consider the limit where g goes to zero, n goes to infinity, so many, many colors of the matrix, many, many, uh, the matrix is very big, the coupling goes to zero, but lambda is held fixed. Okay. That seems to be the natural coupling, because you see that they form, it forms this combination. Right? Then in this way, what would I conclude? I would conclude in this way, we conclude, that the higher genus graphs are not as important as the lower genus graphs. The higher the genus, the more suppressed they come in powers of n. Right? So then uh, we conclude that the graphs reorganize themselves by topology. So now we see that the graphs reorganize themselves by topology and we get that, for example, our minus f, which is just log of z. We should not use this f, we should use a new f, right? Minus f, which is defined as minus log of f, would be equal to a sum of topologies, g equals zero up to infinity. The bigger the, the genus, the higher the topology, the more suppressed it is. It comes with a factor 1 over n to the power 2g minus 2. So the higher genus, so the planar graphs are the most important ones. They are, n, they are proportional to n squared. The genus 1, they are proportional to n to the 0. The genus 2 to 1 over n squared. Then 1 over n to the 4. So if n is big, you can keep the planar graphs. Maybe the planar and the non-planar, right, if n is 100. You don't care about the genus 2, genus 3, genus 4. They are really subliving here. And then for each fixed genus, I sum over all graphs. Then I have a sum over all maps of genus G and V vertices weighted by this lambda to the v. So this guy here, we can say that if I could resum by expanding this function, let's call this curly f, g of lambda, this as an expansion in small lambda, in power series in lambda, tells me how many maps with a given genus and given number of vertices I have. Ah, no, sorry, 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 sorry. Terrible notation, terrible notation. Yes, uh, terrible notation, yeah. Uh, this G has nothing to do, so let's choose a new variable for this coupling. Yeah, this coupling, G, calling it G is terrible, yeah. We already have genus for G, yeah, sorry. Um, uh, let's put a head. Sorry, I hope this is not a confusion. So G hat, G hat, G hat. But of course not here. G is a genus, it's an integer. G hat is a coupling. Okay? Sorry. And there there is no G. It's all it, there's no G hat, it's always genus. Yeah. Okay. I'll call it something else if you prefer. Yeah. And so what do we have? We have that this, more explicit, or in pictures if you want, it's equal to n square times the sum over all maps of genus zero, right? All maps of genus zero, and by this cartoon, I mean this function f zero of lambda, plus 
n to the 0 times all possible maps of genus 1 plus 1 over n squared times all possible maps of genus 2, right? This will be f2 plus dot, dot, dot. And this is exactly how a string theory looks like. String theory is typically defined as a sum over surfaces of increasing genus. If you want, we would arrive later at the definition of string theory as a, a sum of a surface of the given genus or of quantum gravity, where we would also say I sum over all possible universes that can have different, top that are parameterized by topology. So for a fixed topology, this f of lambda is a sum over all possible graphs with that topology. Okay. So yeah. Um, so I think I would like to do. Now, the next point is an exercise in the notes, but I would like to do it. Okay. So, so I want, l let's think a little bit, for example, about the case when I have two vertices and genus zero, w one vertex genus zero, for example, there is this two here, right? So this is two, there are two, sorry, not, there is this graph and the last one, so there is this two. So for example, I know this F zero of lambda is two times lambda plus x, 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 this two is for these two graphs uh, of this type that we saw, right? With one vertex, right? And now we ask what number would be here multiplying lambda square? Well, this is two vertices, right? So let's try to see what the next term for, v, for F zero should be, right? What should be the next term for F zero? So what graph do we want to draw that have two vertices and genus zero, right? So le let's see, so again, so what I want is the following. So I have one vertex and I have another vertex and I want to connect them into a connected graph of genus zero. Okay. So there are a couple of options. Let me show you, for example, one option is this. I can contract this guy with this guy. I can contract here as well, say this one and this one. And then I can contract this one, for example. I can contract this one and then this one, right? which is the same as just this if I, once I make it fat. Okay, so this is an example of a graph that would be plain. That's one type of, of graph. Notice that another option that I have in this picture, I also have the graph, you can make it fat uh, later, which would be like this. And this blob here, instead of putting it outside, I could put it inside. Once I make it fat, these two graphs are not the same. This was like our example that we already saw yesterday. We have two graphs that before they are fat, they are the same, but once we make fat, they are not the same. Right? So this would be related to this, this way. If this blob here was inside this diagram, it would be a different graph. Okay, so that's another type of graph. So we have two of them already. What's another option that makes a planar graph with two vertices? Both blobs inside is equivalent to this. Then it is just seen from the outside, right? 
if this is a sphere, both inside is the same as both outside. There's no inside and outside. What's different is one inside, one outside. So what else? Sorry? Yeah, so the other option. So here, there is one self-contraction, one self-contraction, and two. But we could also do the one where they just contract from one operator to the next. And that's also a possibility. Okay. And the claim, you see, let's see how many there are of each. And the claim is that there are four of these guys. Let's see why four. So because I take the first line and I decide where it connects. But after I decide, the next guy is fixed. Now everyone is fixed. So before, the similar counting was giving four factorial because I choose. Then I choose three for the next, then two for the next, then one for the next. But now just four because it needs to be planar. So I just fix how they fix and then I just go clockwise or counterclockwise and I fix everyone else. So this, for example, just gives four, and not four factorial, right? You see that the other ones in four factorial, four factorial is 24. Four go here, the other 20 are higher genus. They are connected in a way that I cannot draw in the plane. I just want the planar one. Okay, and here, for this type of graphs, we get, uh, um, Four times four times two. That's the number that would come out. Let me just explain this. Um, yeah, there are many ways of counting. You can say like this. You can say that uh, these two fours are the choice of which leg is going to self-contract with the next one. I is going to contract with I plus one. So choose who is I. That gives four. Choose who is I there, that gives another four. And then you have these two, these two options. Do you contract like this or do you contract like this? That's the two. Okay, but you can work out your own counting. It's just a way of counting this. It gives this number. And so in total, this contribution, this number here, so let's be careful, this number that would be here is four plus this number, four, 16 times two, 32 over two factorial from the two vertices, right? From expanding the two vertices. So it's the two indistinguishable vertices. When I expand the exponential, I get one over two factorial times g to the g squared, right? So there's always one over n factorial for the number of vertices. And so this is equal to 18. So this number should be 18. So I should get that this is two lambda plus 18 lambda square plus tac, 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 tac. This is an example of a combinatorical object that counts all planar maps, and this is the beginning of this experiment. Okay. And now there are two exercises here. One is, are there G, genus two graphs? So here we drew some genus one, some genus zero, are there genus two? So let, let's, do, let's uh, I want to do this exercise. Are there g equals two, z equals two graphs? Of course, I'm jumping genus one because I'm going to genus two and higher now. Because we can easily see that the answer is no. Okay, because we just count how many faces they would have. So let's check. So we know that number of faces plus vertices minus edges needs to be 2 minus 2g. So if vertices is equal to 2, edges is equal to 4, 
So, this is f minus 2 and this is 2 minus 2g and so f is equal to 4 minus 2g. So the maximum genus can be is 0 or 1. If genus is 2, I get 0 faces. It's already in top. Right? So this, the answer is therefore no. Okay, so this is question, and the answer is no. So only genus 0 and genus 1. Okay? And how many graphs are there for genus 1? So how many graphs are there for genus 1? So for genus 0, we already worked it out. It was 36 in total. When we divide by 2, we get 18 for the indistinguishable vertices, and we got this nice result. And then we ask how many maps for v equals 2, g equals 1. Okay. Apparently, all other graphs that are not of this type are genus 1. We could just draw them and count them. But we can do something smarter using what we did already. So we can recycle what we did already. Okay. Let me remind you that we did already this counting, that we saw that 105 was equal to 9 plus 72 plus 24. Was it true? Was it something like this? What was this nine? This nine were these disconnected graphs. And these guys were connected. This 72, this 24 was this, right? Was the four factorial we were discussing. And this 72 was precisely counting this type of graphs. Right? Do you agree? So these are disconnected, I don't care. But this is the total number of connected graphs. And we are saying that I should split this number into 36, which are the genus 0. So therefore, how many remain? Okay. So this number is the total number of contractions. So this is 36. 36 is what I'm getting there, right? So it's 4 plus 32. So it's 4 plus 32 at genus 0. There is no genus 2, so everything else is genus 1, so plus 60. So this is the number of graphs at genus 1. Okay, so we don't need to draw them and think of it. We just know that everyone else is genus 1, and there must be 60 of them. Okay, so this is the number we want. And therefore, we conclude that F1, we already know something about F1. Then, so what would you write for F1 of lambda? The sum over all maps of genus 1 where lambda counts number of vertices. What's the first term? So the first term is with one vertex. There it was 2 times lambda, and now it's just lambda, right? Because there's only one graph. It was the 3, it was 2 plus 1, so just lambda. And the next term? plus 30, right? It's 60 over 2 factorial, plus 30 lambda square, plus dot, dot, dot. Okay. And that is what we know about F1 right now. Okay. Now, it turns out that we can compute this FGs analytically, exactly. We can solve this problem and just write down what these FGs are. That's really quite outstanding. It, it, it looks like a miracle that we could do it, that we could compute it. Let me remind you that even for the quartic, for just the usual integral with n equals 1, we have this Bessel function, right? 
And I told you that if instead of x to the 4 you put something else, it's going to be something more complicated that we don't know explicitly. And now it looks much harder. We are separating things by topology, and we want now to count things with a given topology. And there you could expect that the results are going to be much more complicated than these Bessel functions, but they are much simpler. So this separation by topology, because once you tame by topology, there are less graphs that you have to count. And the combinatorics somehow simplify a little bit. And I'm going to give you a hint on how we compute it, but I'm going to tell you that this fg of lambda can be computed in a second, I, as I said, I will tell you how, what's the hint for computing F0. But that's really quite remarkable that people understood in the 80s and 90s how to compute this F, this F. And I want to show you how they look like. And to show you how you look like, you first define a variable u. This is it's an auxiliary variable, which is 1 minus square root of 1 minus 48 lambda divided by 24 lambda. You see this 48 and 24 is just 4 factorial, just from the fact that we are solving a quartic problem. So that's definition. Now this looks very weird, but this quantity has a nice property that it has a nice expansion at small lambda. It's 1 plus 12 lambda plus 288 lambda square plus dot dot dot. So you can just see this expanded in small lambda and it has a regular expansion, right? You see that there is one over lambda down there, but the square root cancels the one, so in total it has a nice regular expansion. Okay, and then, uh, with this definition u of lambda, if I want to write everything in terms of lambda, I have that f zero of lambda, Actually, sorry. Uh, okay, whatever, who cares? Okay, F0 of lambda is U minus one times nine minus U divided by 24 minus log of U over two. That's it closed expression in terms of lambda, which is nicely expressed in, as a u of lambda because it becomes shorter. F1 of lambda is just log of two minus u over 12, okay, et cetera. For example, let, let's just check, let's see if we can check by hand. Maybe it's possible. I did not try to do it, but let's, but for F1 it looks easy to do. If I plug this in F1, just the first term, one plus 12, two minus one gives one, and I get inside one minus 12 lambda, right? But the log of one minus X is just X, right? Just for small X. So I guess just 12, that cancels the 12 and gives one. And that's the first, the, that's the one here. Then you can check that the next term gives 30, okay? So, yeah, there might be some minus signs because normally F is defined with that minus sign. So I'm not sure if what I'm writing is for F or for minus F. So, so there might be overall minus signs missing. But you just see, you expand one of these functions, maybe this function only has all negative coefficients, then there is an overall minus. Maybe this one has all overall positive coefficients, then it's okay. So you, you should just, yeah. In fact, defined as it is, I define minus f. Okay, so if I define it like that, then f zero should have positive coefficients. So minus, minus, so then this should be minus f one here. This one, I cannot do it, really. it's okay. <laughs> um, so for example, this F0, in particular, this F0, now that we know the explicit expression, 
we could exceed this expanded at small lambda and get that this F0 is two lambda, which works, it's what we had predicted, plus 18 lambda square, but now you can go on forever. You can write plus, for example, 288 lambda cube plus dot, dot, dot. So this is the number of graphs with three vertices on genus zero, for example. And here it will be a number that will be number of graphs of, uh, of four vertices on genus zero and so on. And you can even write an explicit expression that this is equal to the sum lambda to the number of vertices, and then the number that counts how many vertices there are, it's a very explicit number. It's 12 to the power v, 2v minus 1 factorial over v factorial, v plus 2 factorial. Okay. So that's the number of graphs of v vertices and genus zero. <coughs> okay, so as you see now, we have a way, so not only did we manage to go from graphs to maps, and the punchline is replace vectors by matrices, and then uh, if the matrix size is large, you will get a result whose coefficient in the size of the matrix gives you access to various topologies that you might want. So typically we are interested in planar graphs, of course, right? It's the most natural thing. It's things that can be drawn on a plane. It's very rare that we care about genus one and genus two, but sometimes we do. In the context of string theory, that could represent strings that interact, split, join again, then we could be interested in higher genus. Now, if it's more like condensed matter, typically our materials are not torus, right? So they are at most a plane, a sphere, something like that. So planes and spheres is the most natural one, which is the most important one when n is large, there is this n square, it's the big one, okay? So typically the planar result is the one we are most interested in, and in this enumeration of planar graphs or, surf or random surfaces that you now see, there is a direct connection. Summing over this graph would be like summing over random surfaces. Okay, so now I would like to do two things. One is just give you a flavor, just an idea of what kind of techniques are involved in getting to this result, because right now it looks like a miracle, right? I mean, we can compute a few examples. How do we go from there to analytic expressions that just resum everything, right? So how, how on earth could we get this log of u? How is u appearing? Uh, so now there is a big gap. I just said it can be done, but I did not give you any idea on how it could be done. So I would like to give a glimpse of an idea, but I'm, I'm just going to sketch the ideas involved. I'm not going to do it carefully. It will take one more lecture to do it carefully. So, so I would like to sketch the basic ideas only. Okay. So the main ideas. Right uh, behind deriving F zero. Okay, so the first idea is to notice that these matrix models, our action for our matrix M uh, was a trace of a polynomial of the matrix M, right? The polynomial was M squared plus GM to the four, but it's not even in part that's a polynomial, it's a trace of a function of M, and therefore it's equal to the same if I just conjugate my matrix by whatever, right? Do you agree? Because for example, trace of m to the four, if I just conjugate, the lambdas cancel, tac, 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 using cyclicity of the trace, right? So for example, trace of m to the four is equal to trace lambda m, lambda minus one, 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 right? Because the lambdas just cancel all together and the first and last cancel by cyclicity of the trace, right? And therefore, we could, be the first idea is to replace this action 
by an action that depends on, say, Z1 up to Zn, where these guys are the eigenvalues of M. Because if it only depends on M, if it's invariant under this symmetry, I can diagonalize M. And if I diagonalize M, I only need to deal with its eigenvalues. And that, if we could do it, it would be huge. Because we start with an n square integral and we would go to an n integral, n dimensional integral. Right? So achieving this is huge. It goes from n square degrees of freedom. Imagine if n is one million, it's one million square degrees of freedom to one million. Okay, or one thousand square degrees of freedom to one thousand. Actually, it looks more impressive because I don't know why. Okay. So this, if we could do it, it's really huge. It goes really to from n square to n degrees of freedom. Okay, so that's the basic idea. Now, that's one, that's the first basic idea. Now the second is when you change variables, this is a very, non, this is a complicated change of variable, right? To go from the elements one, 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 two, one, three, to the eigenvalues of the matrix. So you need to worry about the Jacobian. So the second thing that one has to do is worry about the Jacobian. Right? In other words, uh, we add our integration over our measure. And I want to say that this is some Jacobian that I have to compute times the integral over the eigenvalues, product up to n d z i. But we need to compute this Jacobian. Okay, so this Jacobian is a bit non-trivial to compute, but you can do it. And the result is that you have product over i smaller than j of zi minus zj squared. Okay, so it's, it's a non-trivial Jacobian. It's explicit, it's given in terms of the eigenvalues of the matrix, but that you would need to compute. Okay, which you can write, you see, it's exponential of the sum over i not equal to j of logarithm of absolute value of zi minus zj. Why did I write it in the exponent? Because you see that this Jacobian is like an extra term in the exponent that I should add to my action. So I take the action, convert to eigenvalues, but needs an extra contribution from the Jacobian, and then I get the total action that we would call the effective action. Okay? So the action that I would write after this So, fourth step, we recognize, third step, okay. we recognize that our final effective action for the eigenvalues, zi, is equal. Let's write what the action would be. It would be, you just replace the matrix M by a diagonal matrix with z1, z2, ta, 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 in the action. So what is trace of M squared, for example? when I replace M by a diagonal matrix. Yeah, it's just, it just becomes from the trace part, from the naive part, it just becomes sum of eigenvalues zj square over two from the trace and trace of M to the four. Same thing, right? Plus G Z J to the power four we define it, in this case, we define it just like that. Zj to the power five. Right? So that's the naive part. Just sum over j from one up to n of this. Okay. Plus this term. Plus sum over j not equal to i of logarithm of zi minus zj. Okay, so now I have this action, and I have to integrate over positions of part, uh, position zj with this action here. Okay. 
And now, the fourth step would be to notice that the integral over these eigenvalues e to the minus this effective action is very well approximated by e to the minus the effective action at the classical solution of the equations of motion of this action, at the extremum of this action. And the reason is because this action is very big. And because this exponent is very large, it's dominated by its classical trajectory. Whatever gives the classical value dominates because we are integrating over something huge. Okay? Now, why is it huge? Let's check self-consistency that it's huge. So first, we know it's huge. We know it's huge because we saw that the, the partition function, the leading term was z, was exponential of n squared times something. So it's e to the n squared times something. So it's very big in this. There is a classical term there, n squared. So it, it must be very big. But we can check. So what would be the equations of motion? The very, what is the extremum of this action? So I just do derivative with respect to zj equals zero for this action. Right. So let's just check. So here we just take derivative of the action with respect to zj equal to zero to find the extremum of the action. And we would get uh, something like zj plus 4g zj cubed plus um, another derivative to the x on either of them, so there would be a 2 sum over k not equal to j, 1 over a derivative of the guys here, zj minus zk, with sum over k only here, of course, is equal to 0. And there are n terms here. Okay. So we see that this, let's see how does z scale as power of n. And I want to say that z scales with square root of n. Let's see. Because then you get square root of n here. And here you get 1 over square root of n, but you multiply by n because there are n terms and you get square root of n. So it works. It also works for this one as well, because if z scales like square root of n, here I get square root of n times g times n. But g times n was the tooth coupling that we had fixed. So it's also order one. So it's also good. So you can check that this implies, in particular, that these eigenvalues, zj, scale like square root of n. And when you plug z square root of n here, let's see what happens. We can do it in any terms, but let's do the first one. Square root of n squared gives n. There are n terms. This action becomes of order n squared. Okay? So it's self-consistent. Indeed, the action is very large. It's of order square root of n. So it means that all I have to do, and it's not trivial, but all I have to do is solve this equation, right? solve this equation, and plug it into the action at the zj that solves this equation. And the action for the z that solves this equation is our f0. Right? Because f0 is defined there in the exponent. Okay? Or maybe not. The action is proportional to n squared. So define it's 1 over n squared times the action. This would be our f0. Right? f0 comes defined multiplied by f squared. Now, of course, then this arrow here is complicated, right? How to solve these equations and so on. And that would be step number so four, which is solving this equation. But I want to point out that it's a way simpler problem. We started with a problem of counting maps of different topologies and so on. 
and we are left with the problem of solve a bunch of algebraic equations. It's more than that. These equations have a very nice interpretation. You can think of them that this is like an electrostatic equilibrium condition. Think of the Zs as positions of charges in the complex plane. So these charges, they want to go to the minimum of this potential. So they want to go to Z equals zero, right? This is the quadratic potential, they want to go there. But then they have some Coulomb repulsion. There is a cost of energy if two Gs are very small, that costs a lot of energy. So then they want to repel a little bit. So naively this Z, the minimum solution, you can also see it here, this is in the potential, this is the forces. There is an external force that wants to push them to the origin, that's a linear force and then a cubic force. But there is a one over Z repulsion that wants to repel them and not let them be close to each other. So all in all, what will happen is that you have your potential. Particles, they want to go to the middle, so they want to go to Z equals zero, but because they repel, they will go, they will open up a little bit and be somewhere close to the bottom of the potential, but not exactly all at the middle, but opened up a bit. But how many there are? N, there are many of them. So it's not so useful to describe such thing by the individual positions. What would you use to describe this configuration of particles? A density. So you would introduce some density, right? So you'd introduce some density of particle Z. And then, uh, instead of having to solve n coupled algebraic equations, you have one integral equation, a sum becomes an integral, and I get one integral equation for this density rho of Z. Okay, integral equations are much easier to solve. You solve this integral equation, and it's the, in the solution of the integral equation, you plug in the action and you get that thing. In particular, when solving this integral equation, you find the density is beautifully like this, and there is a minimum and a maximum, right? It goes from one value to the other. It depends on how many you have. They open, 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 and they stop at some point. Right? It's, the picture is really correct. It's, more, it's exactly like this. It's a beautiful density. You can see it's, a, it's like this. And it goes from one, one value to the other. We can call this value minus u and u, and this u is the u that appeared in the formula for S0. So that U has the meaning of where the, these particles are here, okay? So that's the U of lambda that we saw before, okay? <coughs> now still, how to solve this integral equation? This is something in mathematics that is known, but that would be the last step to do, okay? It's called the Riemann-Hilbert problem. I can tell you a little bit more about it, okay? But in the end, what happened was we start with a problem of graph, we went to the problem of map by going from vectors to matrices. Then when we were summing over maps of given topology, we saw that the leading topologies are the most important ones when the genus is small. When the genus is bigger and bigger and bigger, we get more and more suppressed terms in power of one over n. For genus zero, it's particularly powerful to go to eigenvalues of the matrix because the, the, the integral over matrices just depends on matrices up to conjugation. We have to do it carefully because we cannot just replace the action by the eigenvalues. You see that this Jacobian is the repulsion of the particles. It's very different to have a physical system of charged particles which don't interact or which repel each other, right? It's all about the repulsion. That's what makes them charged particles, right? So this repulsion is crucial. It's not a small detail, it's crucial. It's the reason why the density is like this and not just a delta function at the origin, right? So we have to compute this Jacobian, fine, we compute the Jacobian, we recognize that the action has some interaction part and some external potential part. We find the extremum of this action and it gives us directly the solution to the combinatorical problem. So we get this F0, the F0, then you expand and you get all the solutions, all these funny numbers that are solutions to combinatorics. So it's a beautiful duality between combinatorics here and the gas of charged particles there. In the same way that we started our lectures by a map, a duality between summing over graphs and a one-dimensional degree of freedom integral, now it's much richer. It's map here, and here it's charged particles that uh, interact with some Coulomb interaction, right? It's not one degree of freedom, it's n degrees of freedom. 
interacting with, with an electric repulsion. And here it's not just graphs, it's maps. Okay? Okay, so I would like to end uh, with um, a few comments of something that uh, are known and some things that are not known. So far I've told you about, uh, I've told you a lot about things that people know how to solve. But let's see what else we could do with this technology. Where could we go and where are, what kind of things are people exploring now? Or a subset of the kind of things, of course, that people are exploring now. Okay, so what we have seen today was what we call the one matrix model, right? MM matrix model, one matrix model. So it's good to describe maps and so on. Now we can get decorated maps like we did for grad, when we started having two variables, x and y, and we started having red and blue, right? So why don't we have two matrices? And now not only we have graphs, but the nodes can have colors, right? So we could decorate maps, and then we go to two matrix model, three matrix model, etc. For example, for the two matrix model, what would we write? We would say I have integral over one type of matrix M, another type of matrix, say, N. Can I use N? It's not a number the size of the matrix. Can I use it? Or do you prefer some other? I feel bad not using okay. M and N. N is not the size of the matrix. It's the matrix. Okay. Exponential of minus. Let's say that instead of trace of m to the 4, I will have some potential for m. This potential for m could be just g trace of m to the 4 or something else, plus some potential for the other matrix. And what about the kinetic term? Well, the kinetic term, we could do something like for the colors. We could say it's trace of m n, some 2 by 2 matrix, a and then M N. Okay? That would be equal to whatever, M square, N square, but in particular there would be a term trace of M times N. Now, if you have a pro uh, this, this problem, you get a trace of M times N appearing. In fact, you see that without loss of generality, I could say that the kinetic term is trace of m times n, because the ones which are m squared and n squared, I can put them in v. Right? So what's interesting is that I have potential for m, potential for n, and then a coupling between m and n, which is trace of m times n. Right? Now, do you think that everything we said today could ap be applied for this two matrix model? And if not, what step could not be applied for this two matrix model now? What is the dangerous, what's the tricky step now? Suppose we are trying to solve following exactly the same recipes. At which step would we face a small problem? Exactly, right at the first step. Because it's not true that this action for the two matrices, M and N, it's not equal to lambda m lambda minus 1, u, n, u minus 1. This is just not true. And it's not true because of that coupling term, m times n. m times n is not invariant when there are transform the matrix. Okay? So it's harder to go to the eigenvalue, to eigenvalues. Okay? It's not impossible, but it's harder. So Kazakov solved this problem. So it's possible to go to eigenvalues. It's a, it was a much more complicated solution. It took many years after people solved the first matrix model, but it's possible to do. So it's harder, it's possible.
Now, we could then imagine doing three, four, five matrix models, right? For example, remember that in graphs, we were doing exercises, let's just remember that we were doing exercises where we had this A that could couple to B, that could couple, say, to C, that could couple to D, that could couple to A, for example. We could generate graphs very easily like this, right? Do you agree? This would be very easy to generate. So we could imagine something similar in matrix models. So let's imagine that I have N matrices, and I want for my actions to write a sum of a potential for each of the matrices, mi, from i equal one up to n. But then I want to couple the matrices. And I want to say plus trace of m1, m2, plus, and I want to couple them like this, plus m2, m3, plus m3, M4, ta, 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 plus M, N minus one, M, N. I couple first with second, second with third, third with fourth, and so on, up to the last one, right? Of course, you would, you do, would you stop here? Depends, if you want something with that picture, that cyclic structure, you would want an extra one plus M, N with M1, right? If you want one with two, two with three, three with four. Okay, so this is a class of models. These first ones, we would say we have a line of matrices, because we have matrix one, two, three, four, and so on. And the second type of model that contains the last one, we would say we have a ring of matrices, because we closed. So the first one would be relevant if we have this, there is like a first index, that, uh, an index that goes from say zero up to four and the order matters, but four is not neighbor as zero. But the second type of statistical model would matter if there is some cyclicity. If I go around and I come back after going around, right? So this could be relevant for two types of statistical problems, right? You could imagine one where some spin or some value takes values from zero up to three, and one where it takes values from zero up to three, but then four is the same as zero, and it's cyclic, right? It's very natural, right? So if, for example, if my variable is discrete, and it's an angle that goes around, it's the most natural, is the cyclic one. But if my variable is a magnitude of the spin that goes from minus s over two to s over two, it would be the first one that would be more natural to introduce. So this line of matrices, was solved shortly after people solved uh, the two matrix problem. This string of matrix, it's still unsolved. People don't know how to solve this, for example. And, uh, and it turns out that this is exactly the matrix model that uh, is showing up in some high energy applications that we would like to solve. So here's a, no, a very hard open problem, or maybe I shouldn't say it's very hard, otherwise you'll be demotivated, but just solve this matrix model, for example. When uh, just this simple addition of this extra term makes it much harder to solve. Okay. I think uh, the last part of the, of the lectures, I was going to mention a few things about uh, string theory. So in string theory, we sum over surfaces. We typically sum over these surfaces by triangulating these surfaces. And then we have this exercise of putting triangles together. The way we are thinking in these models is not so much of triangulations, of putting triangles together, but rather putting vertices together. So what I was just going to tell you now at the end, but I'll just say by words, is that when you have this language of joining graphs by joining them by vertices, 
you are not joining them by faces. You are not putting faces together. You are putting vertices together. But the putting vertices together or faces together are dual procedures to each other. Whenever you have a graph, you can draw the dual graph where you replace faces by vertices and vertices by faces. And it's a very well-known very well-known thing, and it's through those dualities that we would that I would tell you how string theory is also connected to this kind of uh, of counting. But uh, but the basic punchline is that for each graph or each map, there is this operation of dual graph and dual map that uh, constructs another graph whose vertices and faces are interchanged, and if you apply the duality twice, you go back to the same graph. And uh, there is some cute combinatorics about that. But I think I would prefer to stop 10 minutes before and give time for questions. So I can just stop now. It's okay. Yeah, all of them scale in the same way. Let's see Let's see that. So I'm saying that Z scales with square root of N, so let's check that it all works out. So this term scales like square root of N. This term scales like N, there are N terms, times one over square root of N, so it also scales like square root of N. And this term is G times N to the three halves, but this is nothing but lambda times square root of n. And lambda is held fixed, so it also scales like square root of n. Right? Remember, g is very small, n is very big, so when I have g and n, I must combine them into lambda to know how things scale. Right? Because g goes to zero, n goes to infinity. So in this equation, this equation is proportional to square root of n, and then when I plug it into the action that, I see that the action is proportional to n square, which is what it should be. And then the free energy is proportional to n square. I should emphasize that this part of how do I solve the one-dimensional matrix model by going to eigenvalues, the Jacobian, and so on, I'm giving you a flavor. I'm not expecting people to be proficient at solving this. You are experts in graphs and combinatorics. You are not experts in this Coulomb stuff, this is just to give you a flavor on how could we get this remarkable result that now you can expand and get all the numbers. Ah, okay, sorry. So I'm saying that the partition function Z, I'm doing a, where is it? So when we integrate over, uh, when we integrate exponential of some very big action, this is dominated by the classical solution of this action, by the extremum of the action. So the integral of exponential of something very big is approximately equal to exponential of the classical solution, right? Now, that means that Z, Z is exactly that. Z is the integral of exponential of something very big. So Z is approximately equal to exponential of S at the solution of the equations of motion. That's what it means. Z solve this means Z solution of the equations of motion. So this is the same as S extremum, huh? this. So this is the approximation for logarithm of Z. Logarithm of Z is well approximated by this. But logarithm of Z was not directly F0. F0, you see, was logarithm of Z up to an n square. Right? There was an n square here. So to extract F0, I just divide by n square, just to have something with a good limit. That's right. This was just for F0. I started writing here, right? So idea behind deriving F0, because that's for the leading ones. And now for the sub-leading ones, it's much harder, right? Because this is just like classical solution. It's like, uh, it's like classical physics. So the charges go to classical configuration. Now you want F1, and now it's about quantum charges. Now they, you need to take into account not just the classical configuration, but the quantum fluctuations. That's much harder. 
So in this language, computing F1 is like instead of just computing the equilibrium position of the charges, you need to take into account their quantum corrections. So, and that would be what would give rise to F1. So in practice, there are even more powerful techniques that allow to compute this F by deriving then recursion relations that relate FK, FG with FG minus one. So the, the, more, the more powerful way of doing it is first find F0 and then find some recursion relation that allow you to increase the genus. In the same way, like, like we were saying, that if you have g surfaces of different genus, you can glue them and get bigger genus. So there should be a way of using lower genus to build higher genus, and indeed there is, and we can then take advantage of that. Yeah, so if you have a, a map of a given genus, under duality it maps to a graph, another graph of the same genus. Okay. And so, but if it's same query also to the other graph, the curvature of the recursion, it's not only the charge, but the curvature. Yes, the answer is, is yeah. So the answer is, can we start uh, using this to mimic surfaces that we sum over random surfaces? And can we then try to have some notion of how curved the surface is? And that's indeed how people started doing this. So l let, me, let me say a few words about these dual graphs. What are they? So let's consider a cubic matrix model. So let's consider a cubic one matrix model. So that's given by maps which are triangulations, which are uh, cubic vertices, right? So let's start with a M cubed matrix model. So th this is the potential. And then it means that my graph, the vertices are cubic, right? But the faces can be whatever they want. So the faces can be, for example, an hexagon. Let's draw a graph, for example. One is like this. And maybe I'll draw another hexagon. I don't know why, but OK. And this line can connect to this. This line can connect to this. This line to this. So far, everything is cubic. This line to this. Ah, this is an example of one graph that should appear, one planar graph, right? Did I, did, are all vertices cubic? I hope they are. Sorry? Ah, on the top it's not cubic. So we need, and this one is not cubic either, right? Okay. Is everyone cubic now? Okay. And now we can go here and draw the dual graph, which is the graph obtained by putting a vertex at the middle of each edge. And then uh, each line that separates the two now becomes a line that connects the two. So and now this guy, I connect it like this. This guy, I connect it like this. This line, I connect like this. This one, I connect like this. And so on. And I continue doing like this. And outside, it's just outside of the sphere, there is a point here, right? So now this is a painful one to draw. <laughs> Everyone needs to go there, right? So let's finish this, not so much more. And uh, here, this one, this one would be an exception that would just go off. Uh, I think I drew this full dual graph. Sorry? Yeah, I apologize probably for you. It's painful that I'm missing some lines, but okay. Ah, there are a few lines missing, yeah. Doesn't matter. Uh, it, uh, you get the point. Y you could finish it, yeah? <laughs> yeah, there is a line missing here, a line missing here, there is a line missing here. Okay, and they, they, these three lines, they all go to that vertex. I don't think I, uh, there is one missing here. No, this, yeah, this is missing as well. Okay. okay, but I think otherwise there's no one else missing, right? Did you find anyone else missing? Okay, anyway. But you see that, what's the property of the original graph and the dual graph? Original, 
we have only cubic vertices and we add faces of all types. Right, we can have triangles, squares, etc. Right, so we have sort of an hexagon here, a square here. I don't know if we have triangles, but we could. We have all possible faces, but all vertices are cubic. And in the dual, in the dual, you see that because all vertices are cubic, in the dual graph, all faces are triangles, right? Because uh, each uh, line is there. So now all faces, all faces are triangles, but we have various types of vertices. Cubic, quartic, etc. Right? So for example, here we have a six order vertex. Okay. So, but given a graph that is a dual graph, and you see that it exchanges faces and vertices. And when you exchange faces and vertices, what happens to f plus v minus e? It's invariant, right? So it doesn't change the genus. So this is what measures the genus of the graph, right? And so given a graph, we can have the dual graph. So if the purpose is just counting, you can work with the graph or with the dual graph, right? So it means that this graph for the cubic matrix model, it's equivalent to counting triangulations, counting ways of triangulating a surface. Right? So we have triangulations of surfaces. And once you have a triangulation, if you now there's, there are natural ways of, of giving curvature, of thinking of curvature. What is a, uh, a flat surface? If a, in a flat surface, at the point, how many equilateral triangles meet? Six. So now I can imagine, if I have six triangles meeting at the point, it's flat. If I have less or more, then it's positive or negative curvature. Right? So now, the number of triangles minus six meet, meeting at the vertex, in other words, the valency of the vertex would be related to the curvature of my two-dimensional surface. Right? If I think that these triangles are like equilateral shapes that I'm using to triangulate the surface. Okay? And that's how people would go about trying to discretize two-dimensional gravity and measuring the curvature in terms of these triangles. So what was recently understood, now that I'm doing this, let me then finish and say one more word, is that in the context of string theory, it recently became obvious that in some context that we want to triangulate these surfaces. For example, in string theory, people often want to study a surface where say two strings interact with each other in the past and produce two strings in the future. Right, it's a surface, we have two strings, they move, they interact, and they produce two strings in the future. And this surface can be split into triangles, it can be triangulated. I'm going to cut it in a way that the resulting surface are a bunch of triangles, so I could cut like this, like this, and then like this. You see the picture? This is a triangulation. Let me draw it in a different way that makes it more obvious. A triangulation of this surface. So it's a triangulation, let's draw the triangles. So the four points that I drew here in a nice three-dimensional shape, I can draw as four points here. And then there are a bunch of triangles, which is just this thing here. And you see that all faces are triangles. Here, if you go to each face, it is a triangle. So this surface is four triangles, right? Which means that the dual graph would be four cubic vertices. In 
in the dual graph, right? Now, it so turns out that one type of matrix is not enough to study these string theory problems because you have string theory has more properties, so it's not just, you could imagine, right? You could need more than one matrix, more than one type of vertex. There's not just one cubic vertex. I'm omitting all the details of where is the string theory moving, what are the various polarizations of the string, how is it polarized, it's rotating in which direction. So okay, so you have to believe me that these cubic vertices, there exist a few different ones. And therefore, we need a more than one matrix model. So we need a matrix model to, to kind of tame these problems. So we need an N matrix model. And what kind do we need? Exactly this ring one that is not solved. So, and it turns out that in the context that people are studying now, it's the, this ring matrix model that is exactly showing up. Which we can more or less, we are, we are trying to develop techniques to solving it. We are solving it in some regimes, finding some points where it works, checking, and it seems to be working. But having a full beautiful solution with like this curly F0, F2, and so on, we don't know. And that's an application of this dual graph technology and then of matrix models afterwards for doing the counting. Of course, again, obviously all this is just overview, motivation, and so on, just to give you a broad picture of the field, not to you can follow the technicalities here, of course. No more questions? Don't be shy. So again, as I said, do solve the problems. They are quite useful. There are, I thought, 19 of them, but I only see 17 now. So there are 17 problems. Two of them we solved today, so 15. And they are simple. I mean, as you saw today, the ones we solved. I mean, it's each of them can be solved in five minutes. So it's still two hours of work, but it's worth it. OK, so we are done. Thank you. But only shortly, yeah. I'll come for the morning probably and then go to the airport. Yeah.